All right, thanks for tuning in here to Prime Sports Network as we talk Tampa Bay Buccaneers football. And for the first time, we're going to introduce James Yarcho uh, to our channel. Uh, James, uh, who is taking over now for David Harrison. Of course, you've become familiar if you're on our channel with uh, Bucks Talk with David Harrison. And David will be talking Washington Commanders football from now on. We'll be interviewing him next week, so stay tuned for that. But James Yarcho is going to be joining uh, our team here, hopefully, uh, to talk Bucks football. He's the deputy editor of BucksNation.com and also has the Locked On Bucks podcast that you could check out on YouTube and uh, other streaming platforms, I would assume, James. Thanks for doing this. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Excited to talk about uh, Buccaneers, which, you know, I constantly do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not do it again? Just, you know, uh, you've got the knowledge, so use it, right? That's uh, right. Yeah, that's what I say. Okay. So oh, I want to remind everybody too that uh, we just conducted our interview where we did the top three needs for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on the Our Last Football Network. We'll have a link in the description for that. So you can check that out. Should be posted shortly after we post this video. Okay. So James, let's start off. Uh, first of all, how's the draft capital for Tampa Bay for this draft? It's decent. It's not great. Uh, the trade of Carlton Davis really helped. That gave the Bucks a fourth top 100 pick. Um, so they have four in the top 100. They have five in the top 125. They do not have a fifth rounder. But uh, you know, a lot of a lot of Jason Light's damage has been made in the second day of the drafts. So that's where he's really found some big contributors, and that's where they have three picks. They have one in the second, two in the third, but. You know, overall, they they have a decent amount to address some of their their needs. And Jason Light loves to wheel and deal. So they're probably going to end up with even more picks before the weekend is over. OK, uh, let's also talk about the new in Tampa Bay. And uh, we'll start on the offensive side of the ball with uh, Cohen as the offensive coordinator. Um, interesting resume bouncing back from the Rams in Kentucky. Uh, quite interesting. And uh, I, I wonder how many draft Knicks are going to, even though Baker's on the team, I just wonder how many are going to have Leary uh, somehow, some way, find his way on Tampa Bay, maybe on day two, who knows. But we'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, Cohen, one thing I did notice doing a little research on Cohen coming from the Rams, and we talked about this on the uh, Arleds video, is the lack of uh, rushing uh, yardage uh, for the uh, rushing average for the team the last couple of years and how Cohen probably uh, he's going to come here. And he's going to change that because uh, he, he he learned under McVeigh at LA and, uh, and, 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 you know, contrary to what people think, you know, McVeigh wants, wants balance. And uh, that's what Cohen's probably going to bring here to the Bucks as well. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about it. And you go back and look, Cam Akers' most productive seasons with the Rams were when Cohen was there on the staff. And I don't think that's by coincidence. Yeah. Um, so, and, and you mentioned uh, you know, his Kentucky ties. The the one that I keep seeing is Ray Davis, the running back. Okay. Oh, that's um, a good one. Yeah. And, and you know, that would, that would be fun. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about that in yeah. a little bit. But, you know, Cohen is... He comes from that McVeigh tree, but he's also he also runs things in a very similar way that Dave Canales did last year. Now you would hope that it's a little more consistent and a little more productive, but this isn't a full blown overhaul of the offense. So you know Baker Mayfield, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, you know those those key guys are going to be playing in a similar offense to what they did last year and found so much success even through the, the ebbs and flows of the year. So it's not going to be a huge shock to the system when they're trying to install these things in the off season. Do you think that also uh, because the Rams used by far the most 11 personnel groupings than any team in the NFL that we'll see more of that with the bucks or not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, Cause you, you go back, you know, when Liam Cohen was the, the offensive coordinator, of course, McVay was still the play caller. He was still the one, you know, really holding all the cards, but you know, you, you take a look at the, the best offensive coordinators are the ones that put their players in a position to succeed. And they don't, they don't force those round pegs into square holes. So if, if the best the bucks can do is, you know, as far as getting playmakers out on the field is 11 personnel, then that's what they'll use primarily. But 
this is a team with two really solid pass catching tight ends, two really you know solid pass catching running backs out of the backfield. You have one really good running back, running back, and, and another one that's okay. But then you have you know Mike Evans, you have Chris Godwin. You can you can create these mismatches, and it's all about utilizing you know the best players in in the best way possible. So I would say. 11 personnel is probably going to be the most common, but maybe not by a huge margin. Okay. Uh, let's start then. Uh, let's start with the receiver uh, uh, unit might as well. So I, I've heard about also that they might be moving Godwin back to the slot. Yes. Uh, do, is it, So would you recommend, because, hey, I, I've got the ear of uh, or a man Tucker who does the depth charts at our lads. I can have a change as soon as we're done with this interview. Should I be moving Godwin? Should we be moving Godwin over to the slot right now? Right now? No. Okay. Get with me after draft weekend. Okay. But you know, I, I think Chris Godwin, you know, he only had, he had less than 35% of his snaps last year out of the slot. His most productive seasons, he's had 63% or more snaps out of the slot and you go back and you take a look at how slow of a start he got off to because while he's he's a very good receiver incredibly talented tom brady said that chris godwin had the best hands of any receiver he had ever played with uh, i can't think of higher praise than that but he's not the outside presence that mike evans is oh, when yeah. you think of chris godwin he's the money down guy he is the over the middle those tough catches that move the sticks so Liam Cohen is is going to move Chris Godwin back into that slot role for you know his his primary amount of snaps, and then you go back and you take a look at some of the things that Cooper Cup did in that offense that Cohen was a part of out of the slot. We could be talking about a career year for Chris Godwin, who by the way is on a contract year, and what better time to have career highs all over the place than in a contract year? But uh, I would say that you're looking at two thirds or more of Chris Godwin's snaps this year are going to come out of the slot. Okay. Uh, then Palmer, if they move him to the slot is Palmer, is he if, just as effective outside inside? That's okay. Cause he had a really solid rookie campaign. I think Trey Palmer is more of a situational wide receiver at, at this stage. He, he doesn't have the size or the body, uh, or you know, really the the route running skills to be that other outside receiver. I think you're looking at the Bucks drafting a guy who who will be the other outside receiver and potentially grow into that wide receiver two role if the Bucks lose Chris Godwin. I mean, it's going to be really hard for this team to pay two wide receivers twenty plus million dollars a year, and that's what they would have to do to keep Mike and Chris. So I think you're looking at it at a day two selection, maybe day one, if, if they want to go nuts, but you're looking at probably one of those three picks on day two being a wide receiver. You're looking for a big body guy who can stretch the field, but can make tough catches. And I'll just throw a, a name out there real quick. If they're in a situation where they can draft Johnny Wilson out of Florida state. And now all of a sudden you got Mike Evans, you got Chris Godwin, then you have a six foot seven wide receiver there's no stopping him in the red zone. There's, there's okay. just not, you, there isn't a, a player in the sec in the NFL in the secondary, that's going to win a jump ball against him. So that would be an interesting name to watch, but they're going to look for a guy that's a wide receiver three. Now okay. that can become the wide receiver two. And if that happens, if Godwin leaves and then that guy becomes a number two, now Trey Palmer slides back into that slot position in 2025, where he would be the most effective. Is there anyone else right now in the depth chart uh, to keep an eye on? I know Jarrett had a nice college career. Uh, Tompkins is basically special teams. Uh, any of those five backups right now, uh, we should be keeping an eye on. Rakeem Jarrett, for sure. He he got derailed a little bit by injury early on, but actually made some really, really nice and really tough catches down the stretch over the course of the season. He's a guy that's still kind of growing and developing, but they are going to sprinkle him in at times. And I think he's a guy that can contribute maybe, you know, along the same lines as, as David Moore last year, okay. uh, or you go back to, you know, not, not in the same ways, but you go to the sporadic uh, contributions of Scotty Miller uh, during that, the Tom Brady years where 
you're utilizing him and, and he's going to make some good catches, but he's not on the field a ton. But Rakeem Jarrett's definitely a guy that's going to continue to get a little bit more work as, as the years progress. Uh, do they like, are they satisfied with Tompkins as the number one uh, primary kick returner? Right now, yes. Uh, we'll we'll see what they do in the draft. And with the new kickoff rules, it's more about vision than it is about speed. And so I would expect there to be a little bit of competition there with Devin Tompkins for the, the kick return job. I think he's locked and loaded as the punt returner. But as far as kick return is concerned, with the change in rules, I'll be interested to see how they kind of work on that. Okay, let's stay with the skill positions. And at running back, this actually was one of the top needs uh, mm -hmm. that you pointed out, uh, which might surprise some people because uh, we all know the kind of season, if you follow Bucks football, of course, that Rashad White had. And I was I, I was a big White fan coming out of college. And I think uh, for what he's, I saw in, in just one season, uh, this season, I know he's been, uh, I mean, forget the first season because that really didn't almost count. But he was really, really uh, – he reminded me almost of Le'Veon Bell's patience in a way. Uh, sometimes it looked like he was almost too too uh, patient in his running. Uh, but boy, did he come up with those big, uh, especially receiving, as you mentioned on the other video. Uh, he's an all-around really top running back in this league. And if he was playing maybe on uh, the Cowboys or something like that, I think people would understand that even more. But he's going to have a great career. Problem is there really isn't much – effectiveness after Rashad White. And you mentioned that Sean Tucker, even though people wondered, well, he could have been drafted last year um, and started the season. It looked like they were giving him a fair chance to get a lot of carries early on, but uh, apparently that, that didn't work out. I'm not sure whether or not he'll have a chance, a real chance uh, to succeed this season, but either way uh, it looks like uh, they're going to need another running back, especially one with some size. Correct. Yeah, that's that's the biggest thing. And and Rashad White, no matter if if the Bucks draft a guy or not, he's your locked and loaded RB one. And, and you take a look at what uh, at what Rashad does. You know, he's a, a really solid runner. He is fantastic catching the ball and making plays in space. When they started running through the air last season, and and getting these little dump offs to Rashad White to get him in space and let him make plays, that's when the team's offense really started to take off. And that's actually allowed them to get the run game going. But then you go to Chase Edmonds, who who will come on the field and, and give Rashad a little bit of a breather. He doesn't offer anything that Rashad White doesn't offer. And then Sean Tucker struggled. You know, he had his opportunities early on, couldn't find his way back on the field. Patrick Laird, he's a special teamer at best. They don't have that short yardage guy. They don't have that bruiser. They have two quick, elusive, fast backs they don't have their, their power guy. And, and one player that I continuously point to that would be the ideal fit, in my opinion, for the Buccaneers would be Audric Estime out of Notre Dame. And, that, and that's a guy you can land on day four. But you go back to the dirt cutter era of the Buccaneers with Charles Sims at running back. And Cutter was telegraphing exactly what the Buccaneers were going to do on offense anytime Charles Sims stepped on the field. A player like Estime, you don't do that. He can run the ball. He caught every target he had at Notre Dame, and he can make those catch and run plays. He can block. So you're, you're bringing a guy on the field that has a different skill set in terms of his size and his power but you're not taking anything away in terms of the ability to run the ball, catch the ball, or pick up blitzes for Baker Mayfield. So you can do anything with Rashad Edmonds or Estime on the field, and it's going to, to work beautifully. Then you get late into games, and you let Audric Estime start plowing into these linebackers and these, these offensive linemen wear them down. You bring in Rashad White, who hits them with a different level of speed, and it's really going to open mm -hmm. up the run game. So that's what I'm looking for in a running back for the Buccaneers is, you know, that guy that compliments Rashad White, not that, you know, takes his job. Because I do think Rashad White is the RB1, but you got to bring in something that helps the group, not another guy that does what White and Edmonds already do. Okay. Yeah. I, as you were uh, talking about estimating, so I, I, I just received this in the mail. This is the R Lads draft guide. So I was taking a look at uh, the running backs uh, that you had, because you mentioned him just a couple minutes ago, Ray Davis. So it's interesting that 
So Ray Davis, this is page seven and page eight. Ray Davis and um, Estime, Ardrick Estime, are uh, both basically rated right next to each other. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they're both rated as projected as third to fourth round running backs. Now that's our lads. Now, of course, that doesn't mean they can't go in the second round. Could, but um, sure. it only takes a, one. Team. Yeah, and but th that's a nice position though to to to, to get it, to get running backs like Davis or Estime in the third round. I take that any day of the week, especially when you have a Rashad White as your number one. Talk about Davis because that intrigues me too. Because I'm a big Ray Davis fan. I just loved watching him run last year, especially with his physical uh, style. Uh, getting a kid like that in the third round and with the ties to Cohen could be interesting as well. Yeah, don't ever underestimate familiarity, right? Liam Cohen coaching Ray Davis last year, and that was Ray Davis by far his most productive year in college football. If I remember correctly, I just talked about him on my show about a week, a week and a half ago. His numbers at Kentucky last year in terms of rushing yards, it was either rushing yards or all-purpose yards, were more than all of his other years combined Wow! Uh, in college. And then touchdowns. Uh, he had, I think it was 17 last year. He didn't even have that in all of his other years combined. So he went absolutely nuclear with the Kentucky Wildcats last year under Liam Cohen. That's a guy that I could absolutely see them trying to bring in and add. The, you know, kind of the knock that I've seen from some people is his age. I mean, this is a a guy who's 24 years old as a rookie, and that's pretty old in, in football years. So you may not, by the time he's getting to a second contract, he's already reaching kind of that cliff that, that yeah. we see running backs fall off of. So this could be a, a, a one contract kind of guy, but the the versatility that he brings again, much like Estime, he's really good in those short yardage situations. You're not losing anything. Uh, in terms of rushing, pass blocking, or pass catching when he comes on the field versus when Rashad White is on the field. Yep. So you're looking for those those backs, basically three three down backs that you can utilize as your RB2 and, and not lose anything in the offense and yes. tell the, the opposing defense what you're about to do. Yeah, th th that's the thing right there, is that knowing that. Because when White goes off the field, it's like, all right, you know, yeah. When's he coming back on? Because <laughs> you know the offense is not going to be anywhere near effective with him off the field. But you bring one of those two kids in, and you're feeling pretty good. You're like, hey, especially because they're th – th 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 what are they going to have, 10 snaps a game, 15 snaps a game? They're going to be juiced right. and, and healthy, and they're young. Let's now talk about uh, the tight end room because um, it looks on paper to be really set for a few years now uh the two kids from the 2022 draft including kate otten of course who had a big year last year and Payne durham who's a heck of a receiver uh it was one of uh, aiden o'connell's big boys uh of course if you're a, a raider fan you're familiar with o'connell and uh durham was one of his boys in college in 2023 so am i wrong are they are they set for the next few years at tight end i don't think so Oh, now, really? Wow. That doesn't mean that they're going to address it in the draft. Um, but this is a position I have kind of uh, earmarked as being a second wave post draft of free agency kind of of position to address. You have you have Kate Otten. He's your tight end one locked and loaded. Um, Payne Durham came on late in the year and, and made some some solid catches. You have Co Keeft, who is. He was drafted for his blocking. Bucks fans get all excited when he makes a catch because it rarely ever happens. Okay. Uh, but David Wells and, and Taula, 100% replaceable. If you can upgrade at that position, especially with a player that, that Cohen is familiar with, um, that can not only catch, but can also pass block, can also run block, and okay. you can upgrade the depth there, I think you're going to go ahead and do it. Um you know, I, I love the combination of of Otten and Durham and what they can do as pass catching tight ends together. But again, kind of like I, I talked about with the running backs, when Co Keeft is on the field, you know he basically has one job. True. And and you know he's not going to be a threat. Every once in a while that bites a team in the butt. But again, it's so far and few between that you're willing to take that risk to ensure that it's not Otten, it's not Durham, it's not. Evans or Godwin or or Rashad out of the backfield that is going to you know 
have an explosive play. So you need to get one of those multifaceted tight ends to upgrade the position there. Uh, if they stay like this for 2024, I understand, but I, I think that it's a position that they're still looking to potentially upgrade their depth. Uh, do you think based on what you've seen from Cohen, uh, that they'll use a lot of two tight end formations? Uh, I think given the, the threat that you could have out of a two tight end set with Otten and Durham, uh, it's it's yeah. going to get worked in for sure. Okay. And and again, it, it might be one of those where early in the year, he's going to hyper target. He's going to have Baker hyper target Otten and Durham so that you know they start to make teams think, OK, we really got to watch out for for both yeah. of these tight ends. And now all of a sudden you're you're getting Mike more involved. You're getting Chris more involved. You're getting Trey Palmer and, and Rashad White and those guys more involved. Um, but you have to establish that threat before you can really utilize it. Okay. So getting those tight ends involved early in the year, I think would, would really go a long way to how Cohen continues to use them throughout the season. And, and, and uh, uh, Keith, he'd be the one that would be uh, in jeopardy. Cause if you find someone that's more of an all around tight end, then the snaps are going to be taken away from him. Unless of course he becomes so good of a blocker that, he just has to be on the field with another tight end who has some receiving skills, but uh, he's the one that would be a little bit in jeopardy of the, of the uh, playing time. Correct. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say so, but I've been pounding the table on locked on bucks for over a year now that co needs to be a fullback. You oh. need to line him up in the backfield as a lead blocker for Rashad or chase or whoever the running back is because if he gets ahead of steam and is able to help create some of those creases, especially with the struggles the Bucs had at the offensive line, that is that is an entirely new weapon that the Bucs have in their arsenal. Will they do that? I sincerely doubt it because okay. NFL teams just don't believe in fullbacks anymore. It's really sure. upsetting. Um, but yeah, I would say that if they bring in a, a more well-rounded tight end, you're probably going to see that player cut into – Keeft and Durham's snaps. Uh, then again, Kate Otten was on the field for something ridiculous, like 88 or 90% of snaps last year. 96%. 90. Okay. So it was yes. even more than I thought. Crazy. You got to lessen, lessen his workload. Yes. You, you need Otten's snaps to come back a little bit to preserve him. So I could see, you know, a new tight end cutting into Cade's snaps, maybe, you know, by association because now Durham is going to get more snaps yep. and then that, that tight end is going to get more snaps as a result. So yeah. yeah. Oh, per, protect Kate Otten by all means. And and for those watching or, or listening to this that are locked on bucks listeners know that I am the president and founder of the Kate Otten fan club and Kate Otten is my dude. So protect okay. him at all costs. Yeah. And, and the same, same thing with Rashad white. I mean, these guys yeah. are so good at what they do for the bucks, but y y they can't be driven into the ground uh, uh, with uh, snaps and over playing time. And that makes a lot of sense. One season's okay, but that's why the next draft, you got to help these kids out. Okay. Exactly. Uh, offense. Well, quarterback, we can kind of brush through this. So Baker Mayfield, he gets the three-year deal. With all this guaranteed money, this this means he's going to be here for three years, correct? Uh, I believe so, but there there's essentially an out after two. Okay. Um, but you know, I I think Baker's the guy that they want to roll with. I mean, this is this is still a guy that they engaged in preliminary trade discussions when he was still with the Browns before Brady unretired and and came back for that that final 2022 season. So this is a guy that Jason light loves Todd Bowles love. He is beloved by all of his teammates, uh, you know, barring anything really, really catastrophic. I don't see him, you know, being gone before the contract is up. Okay. Uh, so any chance then is it too early is next year the year, or I don't know how they feel about Trask, but is next year the year that they think about, all right, maybe we should just dabble in uh, some somewhere early in the draft for a quarterback just in case Baker's not here uh, in the third year of his contract. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a, a 2025 draft kind of situation. Uh, you know, Trask, he he was drafted in the second round. He competed for the starting job, didn't get it. He'll be a backup here. He'll get to hit free agency, uh, explore his options. Maybe he sticks around and, and maybe, you know, he decides that, you know, he'd rather stay as a, as a backup in Tampa than go to another team and be a backup. It depends yeah. on what situations are out there. I don't think any teams have seen enough out of him to, to give him a starting job. Mm -hmm. This isn't a Mike Glennon situation from a few years ago where he, he got some starts, he got some playing time and then Chicago ended up signing him. So uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't address quarterback in this draft. That doesn't mean they won't, but I personally wouldn't because you still have Kyle Trask. You still have, John Wolford, uh, I would pretty much just leave that one alone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause it doesn't make much sense, especially if it may feel this year for three years, then all of a sudden you just kind of in a way wasted a pick. Um, right. So, uh, all right. Yeah. By the way, I should have mentioned this in the, in the outset because uh, th this is my first opportunity since last August, September to address Bucks fans, but I did predict the Bucks win their division last year. So, and Nicely I was, done. yes, I was, uh, I, 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 so I had confidence in what I saw in the preseason, especially. And that's why the preseason does matter a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. You just want to see some things sometimes with some teams and some players. And I, and I saw that with Baker and, and got a good read from the preseason and the, and the division, let's be honest, the division was takeable. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. So anyway, so I, I do have a lot of, um, uh, I had a lot riding on Tampa Bay myself. I was rooting for them every week and uh, picked them a lot when, when they had those big road games and those big upsets. And so um, I'm coming from a specific angle. Just wanted to let Bucks fans know. I'm not a Buccaneers fan, but uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of, of Bucks uh, fever in me after last year. Okay. Uh, offensive line. So this is the big one uh, as far as I could tell on offense. And especially in the middle, which is what you addressed on the R Lads video as possibly their second big draft need. Mm -hmm. And so, so right now I see one player that was drafted high um, that I guess could still be part of their future on the interior. And that's mock. Tell me, uh, it looked like statistically he struggled. Is that the case? Is there still a lot of hope that he's definitely the guy? He just needs some time. And if that's the case, we just have to figure out the other two spots on the interior. Yeah. Cody Malk is going to be completely fine. He had his, his ups and downs. Yeah. You know, it was a rookie season. He kind of hit a rookie wall there uh, you know, late in the season, but overall he he's going to be a really solid offensive lineman. Uh, you, know, you take a look at the growth and, and it probably helps from switching positions, but you, you see how badly Luke Gedick, he struggled his rookie season. Yep. Then last year he was, outstanding at right tackle. So the only position you really need to address for the Bucks is left guard. And you can do that in one of two ways. You can draft a guard. You know, I've been talking about Graham Barton. You know, he's a guy that I would move up in the first round to go get. Uh, you know, there are day two guys. And, and again, Jason Light makes his money on day two of the NFL draft. There, there might be a guy that he has pegged. You, know, you look at, Christian Haynes at a, at a UConn, he could be a, a potential fit there, but you know, you can draft a guard or if Jackson powers, Johnson falls to you at 26, <laughs> yeah. you can take him. And now Robert Haynes, he slides back over to guard, which is where he played at Notre Dame. And now all of a sudden you have solved your, your offensive line problem. Tristan Wirfs, arguably the best left tackle in football. He's, you don't have to worry about him. Luke Gedeke, for the most part, you don't have to worry about him. Cody Malk, I expect to see some growth from year one to year two, like we saw with Gedeke and Robert Hainsey. I, I I love Robert Hainsey. Wonderful, wonderful person. Really struggled last year. And it's, it's hard to tell if the struggles were him or because of the additional struggles at left guard that they yep. had all year long. So I'm not ready to to dismiss Robert Hainsey as a viable starting center. His drop-off was pretty painful, but you go back to 2022 and he was in the top half of the league in, in centers in terms of, you know, metrics and, and analytics and grades and things of that sort. And then just fell off a cliff. 
I, I need to see him with a more viable starting option next to him in between, you know, Hainsey and, and Werfs, or if Hainsey is the one that's going to be next to Werfs. So I still think he is a starting caliber offensive lineman. Really got to fix, you know, that, you know, I I, I know Sua Opeta and then uh, Ben Bredesen were both brought in and they were yep. expected to compete. I still think you can do better. You Those are just depth pieces, basically. Yeah, I mean, and and one thing that Jason Light loves, and, and you see it with a lot of these different offensive linemen, is the versatility. He loves his offensive linemen to play multiple positions. Okay. So that allows them to kind of carry fewer of them because so many of them can play so many different positions. And I think that's what you're you're going to end up seeing with Ben Bredesen, who has played all these positions. Um, you know, Opeta, he's an interior. But Bredesen can play all over the offensive line. He's a depth piece. Um, you still need a starter there at left guard. Okay, so yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, just looking at it, even on paper, and uh, if they can get that filled, and who knows? I mean, you're talking about the second round. You got Mock, you got uh, Gedicky, both second rounders. So maybe 22, 23, and 24 in the second round uh, yep. on the offensive line. We might see that in this year's draft. Okay. Let's now take a look at the defensive side of the ball. Todd Bowles department. I got to ask you about Bowles though, since we're on this defensive side. If, if they fail to make the playoffs, is he the head coach? Uh, I guess it depends on why they don't make the playoffs. Okay. I mean, are, are we, I bet they lose to Carolina and they don't make the playoffs. Um, I, it's it's situational you know it's so hard to tell like did they not make the playoffs because they went three and 14 and just completely imploded all over themselves sure. well then no todd Bowles isn't the head coach yeah. did they not make the playoffs because they were you know seven and four and then baker got his leg broken and kyle trask couldn't elevate the team sure. then no todd Bowles is still there um i think todd Bowles has done actually a really good job and, and I, uh, like any buddy with a podcast or, or a, a written outlet, there are times that I will criticize Todd Bowles because I feel that he deserves criticism, sure. but I don't think any head coach is, um, is free from that. You yeah. know, I don't care if you're Andy Reid or Bill Belichick, there are things that you do in games that, you know, deserve questioning. But I think, I think things would have to go unimaginably catastrophic for Todd Bowles to be fired. Okay. Well, hey, look, and he deserved it after what happened last season. So, like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and it wasn't like they weren't competitive uh, after winning a playoff game and uh, and and hanging around with Detroit for four quarters. Okay. Uh, so on defense, we talked on the other video about the biggest need being edge, and so Diaby, the rookie. Uh, that looks like a find because he led the team. So that's a good and a bad. He leads the team in sacks, but you don't want your third round rookie with seven and a half sacks to lead the team in sacks, which is why this is a position of need. Um, and what you're saying is, is try on. Uh, it looks like he's not, he's not going to be really counted on now as a pass rusher. He's going to be counted on as a jack of all trades. Somebody that could do a whole lot of, 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 of different types of things for you, a solid player, but not an edge rusher which is why once you get past those two guys, um, there really isn't much left unless you think Ramirez can turn into something, but that's still an unknown as well. Yeah, I know Jason Light was really, really excited about getting Jose Ramirez in last year's draft in, in the potential that he had. Um, and it was one of those where he's like, you're going to be excited about this pick in about a year or two. Okay. Uh, so I think they do have some some high hopes for some growth. Now, to be fair, Jose Ramirez was derailed big time by injuries last year. So he never really got a true opportunity. But there's also some belief that, that Marquise Watts can be a solid contributor, probably in a similar way that Anthony Nelson is. You know, he's going to come in, he's going to get some snaps, probably going to come away with two or three sacks, and, mm -hmm. and that would be it. But you need that rotation there. And, and that was a big reason they brought in Randy Gregory was to be part of the rotation. If you're going to utilize Joe Tryon Shoyinka as quote unquote, a chess piece and Todd Bowles named his four chess pieces on defense. It was Joe Tryon Shoyinka, Levante David, Zion McCollum, Antoine Winfield Jr. 
These are guys that he believes he can line up anywhere on the field mm -hmm. and put them in a position to make a play. And so Tryon may line up at edge, but then he may put his hand in the dirt and be the, you know, right next to Vita Vea. They might line him up next to Levante David as an inside linebacker. They may line him up in the slot, uh, you know, just to basically come in on a blitz, you know, out of the slot corner position. They're going to put him all over the place. But this is a player that, you know, four and a half sacks, four and a half sacks, five sacks yeah. for a first round pick. It's not good enough. Yeah. And he was getting so close in 2022. And I talked about it a lot on my show that he's getting pressures. He has to take the step to turn pressures into sacks. And instead he took 25% less snaps last year than he did in 2022. And he struggled now still ended up with more sacks than Shaq Barrett. But that's really not saying much. You know, Shaq Barrett struggled a lot too. Um, so you you have Yaya Diaby, who you want to see take a big step. And you have Joe Tryon Troyinka, who's going to line up an edge along with about four other positions on the field. You have to have that other outside presence that's going to put pressure on defenses. And the, the caveat that I will throw in, and I know we're going to get to the position in a little bit, is if you don't get an edge rusher, but you have the opportunity to draft Jerzon Newton, the defensive lineman out of Illinois. If he starts to drop, now all of a sudden Logan Hall, who has disappointed greatly as their first pick in 2022, if you line up Jerzon Newton, Vita Vea, and Kalijah Kansi next to each other, you can't double team all those guys. Vita Vea is getting the double team. Now you have Kansi and Newton, who I think is the consensus number one defensive tackle in the draft. You have those guys getting one on ones. Plus, you have Yaya getting a one-on-one. -on -one. You have Joe Tryon Trinko or Randy Gregory or Anthony Nelson or whoever, or potentially Jonah Ellis uh, as a second-round pick. You have those guys getting one-on-ones. That's a scary, like that. yeah. scary front, uh, yeah. you know, front seven. Plus, you you know, Todd Bowles is still going to do what Todd Bowles does. He's going to bring Levante on blitzes. He's going to bring uh, Servassier Dennis on blitzes. He's going to bring Antoine Winfield Jr. from all over the place. He's going to blitz Christian Isian. That kind of move, I think, could replace edge rusher just because of the level that Newton plays, along with Cansey, who's just unbelievably, uh, you know, a freak athlete, and then Vita Vea, who's one of, if not the best nose tackle in the NFL. That changes the whole landscape of the defense. Yeah, because that's that's the reason why if we, it's, it's talked about a lot. You don't reach. You, if, if the player's there, if Newton's there, and the, the edge rusher is 10 spots, oh, well, maybe we could trade down. All right, we'll do that then. But if you're staying where you are, no, why not? Take Newton, do it. Uh, that could be a very scary front uh, for a 3 4 base, that's for sure. Okay. Um, you mentioned Dennis. He only had 104 snaps. He was a fifth round draft pick. Are they expecting uh, bigger things from him? I think they should. And and one of the things that I go back to is, you know, and Dennis dealt with a lot of injury too. The, the Bucks were just really decimated with injuries, especially on the defensive side of the ball last year. But I go back to post-draft last year, and I'm I'm watching all of these pit games, breaking down Kalaja Kansi, David and I, uh, you know, my co-host from Locked On Bucks at the time, who's going to be on talking about commanders with you guys. We're sitting there watching. We each took different games of Pitt and we're watching and he and I start texting each other. Like, are we watching Kalijah Kansu or are we watching Servassier Dennis? Because this kid pops off it, you know, he just stands out so well and is so athletic and is so good and makes so many great plays. And he made some good plays early on, then started dealing with some injuries and, and okay. couldn't really find his way back. I think KJ Britt did enough to earn that starting role when he took over for Devin white last year. But he's not as versatile as Devin White was. Servassier Dennis can be. And I think that's going to be a really interesting competition to watch. Is KJ Britt going to be handed the starting job or is Servassier Dennis, you know, now that he's healthy, is he going to pop, uh, you know, pop off the way he did at Pitt and really take that job away from KJ Britt? It'll it'll be interesting to watch, but Servassier Dennis is he's very very good and just not talked about. Well, I'm glad we talked about him then. 
uh, okay. So uh, let's uh, kind of uh, kind of segue into defensive line and inside linebackers. Well, we, we kind of talked about inside linebackers, except David. So it seemed like a couple of years ago, people were like, well, you know, he might he probably doesn't have much left in the tank and you got to start thinking about replacing him. Some guys just, they can't be replaced. And he still seems to be playing at a pretty high level. I mean, how many more years do you think he has? As many as he wants. I, that's, that's really the best answer I can give. As long as Levante wants to keep playing, um, he's he's going to. And it's going to be for Tampa. Um, now, with that said, I, I also think that Levante David is the type of player that knows when it's time for him to walk away. I don't think he's a guy that's going to hang on a year or two too long. He'll he'll know when it's right to walk away. But after the year he had last year, there was yeah. no way he was walking away. Um, and and who would have thought that Levante David, you know, if you if you rewind the clock five years, who would have thought Levante David would still be on the roster when Devin White was not after they used a, a top pick on him. But Levante David, he's he's as reliable of a player as you're going to find. He's as good in the locker room as anyone you're going to find. He is a, a mentor, a leader, a teacher. He is everything to the defensive side of the ball for the Buccaneers. And I know Bucks fans are thrilled that he's back for another year. Okay, so with you mentioned White. So with White out of the picture, uh, the team at this point, they haven't done anything to replace white is that do you believe that that's what dennis is is possibly there for and that they're not going to feel the need to use a high pick or really any pick at all on a player unless it's a fifth round or sixth round or seventh round or type um what do you how do you think they they're, they're going to look at that and 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 are and will the bucks miss devin white um uh, i'll i'll Start with the most recent and work my way back. Uh, I don't think the Bucks are going to miss Devin White, and I think the vast majority of Bucks fans are not going to miss Devin White. Um, they're going to miss some of the splash plays. They're going to miss the the get live forty five and the lasso sack dance or whatever it was <laughs> he does because he did make some fun eye popping you know, splash plays, sure. but he missed far more often than he hit, and it it wasn't you know probably two, three weeks into the season before I started talking about Devin White in the same breath as Quan Alexander. That, you know, Quan Alexander made big splash plays, but he That's missed right. more than he hit. Yep. And some team was going to pay him a King's ransom to get him away from, uh, you know, from Tampa. Turns out they didn't need to because he only got like $6 million from Philadelphia because he was so bad last year. But, you know, this was a guy that at the scouting combine, when David, you know, talked to him, was saying, I want to be a $100 million linebacker. Well, head got a little too big after the Super Bowl run, and you know that started to affect his on-field stuff. So you know, that's a long way of saying, no, I don't really think the Bucs okay. or, or the fans are going to miss him. Now, as far as addressing the position, I think they have two viable starting candidates in K.J. Britt and Servasia Dennis that can come in and replace him. Now, I also wouldn't rule out the Bucks taking a linebacker in the draft. And depending on who falls, who's there, I could see them using a late third or a fourth round pick on a linebacker, depending on how things fall and, and how they feel. But I don't think they're going to press the issue, but they're also not going to pass up a, a prospect that they feel is someone that can help this defense get even better, regardless of what the position is. Okay, makes sense. Uh, up front, you mentioned Hall. So, uh, what's been the biggest disappointment so far from Hall? Is he? What is he? What is? What's happening there? What's not happening there? I just for for a player that they took with their very first pick in 2022, the impact that he has made has not been great. Now, I will say in in Hall's defense, his opportunities from 22 to 23 increased. And his production increased. So he's okay. on the right trajectory, but he's not having the, the big impact that they thought he was going to. If he did, 
they're probably not drafting Kalijah Cansey last year. Now, of course, Hall could have taken that a little personally and, and upped his game because he's like, well, I'm not going to lose my my starting job. I'm going to make sure that I'm still I'm still a big part of this defense. So the defensive line is a position that, much like inside linebacker, I could see the Bucks leave completely alone. But I could also see if the opportunity presents itself that they can upgrade if a Jerzon Newton falls to them at 26, a guy who was typically mocked within the top 15 yeah. you know, uh, across these mock drafts. That's too good to pass up. And yeah. now you're in a situation where not only do you have Jerzon Newton coming in to line up with Kansi and Vea, but you have Greg Gaines, who was a you – know, he had some, some solid plays for them last year. You have Mike Green. You have Logan Hall. Now you're starting to be able to get more of a rotation going. You're able to keep these guys up front fresher yep. and really be able to make a bigger impact later in, in these football games. It's not all on the shoulders of Kalijah Kansi and Vita Vea to be, you know, 90, 95% snap count guys yep. and wear them down. So again, I can see them leave it completely alone, but if, if there's a, a guy that they feel is going to make the pass rush better and help the secondary by getting pressure after the quarterback, you know, they'll, they'll pull the trigger. Okay. Wrap up with the secondary. A lot to talk about here. You mentioned, uh, of course, uh, dealing their, um, I don't know, top corner, um, mm -hmm. Carlton Davis. So he's gone. They get some draft picks for that. Uh, so they bring in, they bring back Whitehead at safety. They bring in Thomas, who seems to be a very underrated player. Um, me being from, you can see the, the little half R behind me. I'm, I'm a Rutgers guy. I'm from New Jersey. So I know all about Christian Izian. You don't have to tell me about Christian Izian. So uh, really happy and not surprised to see that he's making a name for himself as a college free agent. Um, so, yeah. So, and then Bryce Hall uh, being a Jet fan. I know about Bryce. Uh, I'm glad he's getting an opportunity somewhere else. So, uh, you know, he's somebody that could be an intriguing depth piece. Um, and then, I mean, Antoine Whitfield, uh, how do you not fall in love with this kid watching him back in his days in college? You just knew he was going to be a superstar back in his days in Minnesota. And he's turned yeah. into that. And um, he might be the best defensive back in football right now. I mean, I, I got to give a shout out to Trevor Sikama over Pro Football Focus because he was making the case that Antoine Winfield Jr. should have been the defensive player of the year. Um, and, and the case that he made, you know, the what Antoine did at safety last year was something that we haven't seen out of a defensive back in over 20 years. Like, just all, all across, yeah, he was the best safety in football last year. He was arguably the best defensive player in football um and you could say that the impact that he had week by week was bigger than what miles garrett did because miles garrett fell off about halfway through the year uh antoine was every single week he was going to make the play for the defensive side of the ball i've never seen a safety i've never seen a defensive player cause not one but two fumbles at the goal line to not only stop a touchdown, but also get the ball back for the for the team in the same year. It was incredible. So yeah, Antoine Winfield Jr., uh, best safety in the NFL, first team all pro. Uh, give him his gold jacket at halftime sometime this season, uh, probably the week after you give it to Mike Evans. Uh, but uh, in, in all seriousness, I I really, really like what I saw out of Zion McCollum last year. His growth from year one to year two was absolutely incredible. And, and I made the argument on my show that Zion McCollum and Christian Izian were the two most reliable corners on the team last year because Carlton Davis was widely uh, inconsistent. Jamel Dean was wildly inconsistent. And both of them were the only thing consistent about Davis and Dean last year was that they were missing games. And that's why Zion McCollum had the opportunity to get on the field so much. Well, that landed him a starting job but he's also one of those chess pieces that I mentioned earlier yes. that Thomas was talking about. You know, Zion McCollum played safety against the Detroit Lions in the playoffs. Like This is a guy that Todd Bowles will move all over the place. So do not be surprised in the least if the Bucs use a top 100 pick on a corner. The problem is, and what I've been talking about on my show, 
Todd Bowles defense is so difficult to learn if you are a member of the secondary. It is so intricate and there is so much responsibility placed on you that as a rookie or as a first time guy in the system, like Tavier Thomas is going to be, and I believe Bryce Hall is going to be, if I, if I remember correctly, those guys are going to have a brutal learning curve. And so if you use a first round, a second round pick on a corner, that guy's not going to make an impact on your team at least not a a consistently positive impact for the first half of the year. At least you're looking at a guy you're drafting in 2024 to make an impact in 2025. Okay. Which is why I've kind of steered away from, you know, I like Cooper DeGene. I like Kool-Aid McKinstry. Those are not to me, generational talents that you have to take in round one. You can take a corner in round two or round three without that pressure, without, immediately having to put them on the field to start and bring them along so that late in the year, when you're making that playoff push, now they're coming in to make an impact, but right out of the gate, a first round corner doesn't help this team. Uh, A second round corner isn't going to help this team for at least the first 10 weeks. So I like where they are now. I like the pressure that's on Jamel Dean after he just watched Carlton Davis get traded after he got a big contract that he didn't live up to. Now Jamel Dean's got to look in the mirror and say, I either go back to the way that I was, and if I play like I did last year, I'm either going to get cut or traded because the Bucs have an out in that contract after this year. And if if that contract was structured a little better, it wouldn't surprise me if Jamel Dean had been moved this offseason for more draft capital. But the one big thing that I would say is I, I like the additions of Bryce Hall. I like the addition of Tavier Thomas. I'm going to be real interested to see if Tavier Thomas can steal that starting job from Christian Isian. However, one of the reasons that it makes a lot of sense for Thomas to become that starting slot corner is for Isian to be able to move back to his original position of safety because the depth, Kayvon Merriweather, Richard LeCount, they, I, I don't trust that depth at all. Okay. So, worst case scenario, if Winfield or Whitehead goes down, I would rather have Isian or McCollum back there on the back end than Kayvon or LeCount uh, stepping in and taking on that starting role. So Todd Bowles might be looking to move Izzy and back for that depth at safety uh, if need be, which would have been a big reason that, that Thomas would have been brought onto the team. And then of course, if you move Zion back there, you have Bryce Hall that can slide up or Bryce Hall might just be waiting in the wings for Jamel Dean to screw up and be like, all right, now it's now it's my time, and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to win this starting job, and and I'm going to get myself a bigger contract. Yeah, Bryce uh, had a very uh, he had a very bright future early on. I mean, when he was uh, drafted with the Jets, uh, they had just they were weak in the secondary back then, and he was just thrust into the starting lineup right away. And he had promise. And then all of a sudden, the very next year, I think it was something happened and it was he got beat somewhere along the lines and like something happened up here and he just couldn't get it out of his head. And it was mental mistake after mental mistake. And he just that, that, he was lost for a year, maybe even longer. Last year, he got it back. And that's why I think this is a good get for Tampa because they might be getting a guy a veteran now on, on the, on the way to realizing his potential. Um, and this could be a really good uh, uh, situation there. Uh, by the way, Josh Hayes, is that, is that just a, a depth piece or is that something, somebody that they uh, like for, for maybe uh, even more? Uh, I mean, they, they like him and he got a little bit of opportunity, but for the most part, he's been a special teams guy. We'll see okay. if, if he can grow and, and become a little bit more than that, get into a, a little bit of a rotation. But for right now, I would say he's he's reliable depth and then uh, one of the, the better special teams contributors. All right. And then wrapping up with the specials team, speaking of that, uh, last year, it's amazing how these kickers just, just – it's like goaltenders or relief pitchers. You know, they, they haven't done anything for like seven teams and uh, they're 32 years old and all of a sudden they come out and they're like striking everybody out and their ERA is at one or they're stopping every puck and it's like, where'd that come from? And that's exactly <laughs> what happened to McLaughlin last year. Night, my, I was doing this with ninth team. I know he's been around a lot. Uh, and then it's, I mean, the guy was like a all pro with his kicking last year. So you just got to hope that continues. Of course. 
Absolutely. And, and I don't think there's a, a team in, you know, over the course of the last decade that has been more snake bit by kickers than the Tampa Bay Bucks have. And, and they found a solid one in, in Ryan Suckup during the Brady years, but he didn't have the leg. You know, if if it yeah. was fourth down and the field goal was going to be over 49 yards, they were going for it. And and they were just basically saying, you know, we, we know Suckup doesn't have the leg. Let's put the ball in Brady's hand and and see if they can get a first down. I love what Chase McLaughlin has done. The most successful season for a kicker in Buccaneers franchise history. He earned <laughs> he earned that contract that he got. And uh, I'm not going to lie. It's kind of nice to be able to talk about a University of Illinois fighting a line. I, for those watching that see the block eye uh, above my shoulder, uh, it's nice to be able to talk about one that's succeeding with Tampa, not like Aurelius Ben, who did not succeed in uh, in Tampa. And then Jake Camarda. He's phenomenal. Uh, went through a little a, a little lull during the season where he was shanking a, a couple of punts, got back on track and, and and got it figured out. But he's one of the best punters um, in, in the league. And then, you know, long snapper. You know, if you're not talking about your long snapper, you have a good one. So Zach Triner, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, but but he's fine. And, uh, you know. I, I think really special teams is kind of a well-oiled machine. The only thing I would keep a, an eye on is the kick returner with those, with those rules changes, Devin Tompkins, when he's had the opportunity to return kicks, hasn't done a great job. He's much better at the punt returns. Um, that, that kick return job could be in jeopardy depending on what players they bring in, in the draft. And if, if any of them have that experience. All right, James, uh, by the way, any, any, as I, move away from the step chart any of these names here that uh are uh free agents right now uh for the box you can see any of them coming back william golston william golston has has been a constant and, and one of the best run defenders that the buccaneers defense has had for quite a while so if he wants to continue playing he was the longest tenured buccaneer uh, on the team last year. He's been on the team longer than Levante David. He's been there longer than Mike Evans. So he is the longest tenure Buccaneer last season. If he wants to play, the Bucs are going to have a spot for him. And uh, again, rotational guy, but welcome with open arms because when he is in the rotation, he does make an impact and, and he is reliable. Uh, give me a prediction. Bucks. they don't trade it. Who's Give, give us a pick. Oof. If it's a player, I mean. I'm going to say Layatu Latu. Um, we've seen his stock start to drop a little bit. And I don't think it should. But I'm wondering if teams are scared off because of the medicals. Yeah. You know, this is a guy who does have a little bit of an injury history. But if Layatu Latu is sitting there at 26, uh, you are handing the card to Trey Palm to run up to the stage and make sure that you get a game-changing impact edge rusher to help out this pass rush. And, and having Latu and Diaby uh, coming off either edge with Vita Vea and Kalijah Kansi in, in the middle, that's that's what offensive coordinators' nightmares are made of. And uh, if you had a guess, are they going to keep their pick? Um... I, I would venture to guess they trade, but they don't trade out of the first round. Okay. Just slide a few spots. I That's kind of been Jason's MO. Okay. Uh, I won't rule out trading up, but I could, I could see them slide a little bit. If, if some of those premier edge rushers are, are gone, if Jackson powers, Johnson and, and Graham Barton are gone, uh, I could see them slide back, maybe try to pick up an additional, pick the next day and or or at least early in the fourth round and then end up landing you know you could get an adani mitchell uh to to be your outside wide receiver and now all of a sudden on day two you're able to get jonah ellis and, and uh you know you could land uh ray davis a running back or aldrich estime or you know any any number of players so it, it would be interesting to see how kind of all of that shakes out but if yeah. If I'm a betting person, I would say that Jason Light moves either up or down, but more than okay. likely down a couple spots. 
And by the way, I keep saying this because it keeps happening. His name keeps popping up. Every interview I'm having, the name Jackson Powers Johnson keeps popping up. Everybody's t- talking about that kid uh, because it, it, he's so versatile in, on the offensive line. And, uh, and and most of the interviews I'm having lately have been in that spot, that area, like you know, mid to late first round. So it's amazing. The kid, uh, this kid's got a... Uh, popular name nowadays. Uh, if they move up, who who do they, who do they want? Is specifically a player? You think m- m- they might be targeting? Yeah, it, it, if they're moving up, it's going to be for a guy like Leatu Latu or Jared. Okay, Christ, I, I think is is really they would gauge kind of how things are shaking out. Uh, and if there's a run on on corners early, and then some of these other teams ahead of them, like the Dolphins. Um, they could use a corner, but could also use an edge rusher. You know, you're going to want to jump in front of them. So you're probably looking at trying to move up with the Steelers. Um, Steelers could of course use the extra draft capitals. They kind of reshape things there. But, uh, yeah, if, to me, if you're moving up, it, it's either for Jared verse or Layatsu Latu, or it's for Graham Barton. Okay. Awesome. James, I appreciate it. Can't wait to, uh, wrap up the draft and, uh, really find out what the bucks do. Uh, when we talk to you again. And uh, you, so you're hosting the Locked On Bucks podcast. Is that a daily show? It is uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, you can find it on YouTube and then your favorite podcatcher of choice. Um, most of the time on Fridays, I go live on YouTube. So that episode usually drops in the early afternoon. Okay. Uh, but I, I love it when people join in on the live shows and they're jumping in the chat and I can interact with a bunch of people. Uh, I'm sure draft weekend is going to be a very busy, but very fun one in that live chat over on, uh, on YouTube. So you do, are you doing a live show during the draft? Uh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go live, uh, shortly after the bucks pick to, okay. to react to it. So I'll, I'll be going live as the draft is still going on. And then day two, I'll probably go live after, um, you know, after the third round, just because the bucks have such late picks there in the third round and, and the picks go so much quicker that by the time I get everything set up, it'll be after night two is over, but yeah, live, live reaction to the bucks pick, uh, no matter what it is, uh, for nights one and two. Appreciate it, James. Thanks a lot. I look forward to talking to you again on the uh, other side of the draft. All right. Sounds good. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it.